of Gautam Buddha by H. G. Wells. Buddha had made up his mind to leave his life of luxury behind and become an ascetic. He went softly to the threshold of his wife's chamber and saw her by the light of a little oil lamp, sleeping sweetly, surrounded by flowers with their infant son in her arms. At last he turned away and went out into the bright moonshine and mounted his horse and rode off into the world. Very far he rode that night and dismounted beside a sandy river. There he cut off his flowing locks with his sword, removed all his ornaments and sent them and his horse and sword back to his house. He met a man in ragged clothes and exchanged clothes with him. And so, having divested himself of all worldly entanglements, he was free to pursue his search for wisdom. He made his way southward to a place where hermits and teachers gathered in a hilly spur of the Vindhya Mountains. There lived a number of wise men in a warren of caves, and imparting their knowledge by word of mouth. Gotham became versed in all the great philosophies of his age, but his acute intelligence was dissatisfied with the solutions offered to him. He took five disciple companions to the jungle, and there he gave himself up to fasting and penances. His fame spread like the sound of a great bell hung in the canopy of the skies. But it brought him no sense of truth achieved. One day, he was walking up and down, trying to think in spite of his weak state. Suddenly, he fell unconscious. When he recovered, he realized fasting and starving himself will not help him gain wisdom. He decided to eat normal food and look for another path to find the truth. He had realized that whatever truth a man may reach is reached best by a nourished brain in a healthy body. When the mind grapples with a great and complex problem, it makes its advances step by step, with but little realization of the gains it has made, until suddenly... With an effect of abrupt illumination, it realizes its victory. So it happened to Gotham. He had seated himself under a great tree by the side of a river when this sense of clear vision came to him. It seemed to him that he saw life plain. He is said to have sat all day and all night in profound thought, and then he rose up to impart his vision to the world. The starting point of his teaching was his own question as a fortunate young man. Why? Am I not completely happy? It was an introspective question. All suffering is due to the greedy desires of the individual. As long as human beings crave things, they will know sorrow and will not be completely happy. There are three principal forms that the craving for life took, and they all caused sorrow. The first is the desire of the appetites and greed. The second is the desire for immortality. And the third is the craving for personal success worldliness and avarice. All these forms of desire had to be overcome to escape from the distresses of life. When they were overcome, then serenity of soul, nirvana, the highest good was attained. Gotham's disciples declared that he was a Buddha, that is, an enlightened being. He preached an eightfold path, that is, eight things one could follow to lead the right life. They are the right viewpoint, the right values, the right speech, the right actions, the right livelihood or way of earning, 
the right effort, the right mindfulness or mental ability to see and understand things, and the right concentration or state of meditation and enlightenment. The last lesson. I started for school very late that morning and was in great dread of scolding. When I passed the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last two years, all our bad news had come from there. Usually when school began, there was a great bustle, which could be heard out in the street. But now it was all so still. M. Hamel saw me and said very kindly, Go to your place quickly, little Franz. We were beginning without you. Not till then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat, his frilled shirt and the little black silk cap, all embroidered, that he never wore except on inspection and prize days. Besides, the whole school seemed so strange and solemn. But the thing that surprised me most was to see, on the back benches that were always empty, the village people sitting quietly like ourselves. M. Hamel mounted his chair, and in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used to me, said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Alsace and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be very attentive. Poor man, it was in honor of this last lesson that he had put on his fine Sunday clothes. And now I understood why the old men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. While I was thinking of all this, I heard my name called. It was my turn to recite. But I got mixed up on the first words and stood there. I heard M. Hamel say to me, I won't scold you, little Franz. You must feel bad enough. See how it is? Every day we have said to ourselves, Bah, I have plenty of time. I'll learn it tomorrow. And now you see where we have come out. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, How is it you pretend to be Frenchmen and yet you can neither speak nor write your own language? M. Hamel went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world, the clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it among us and never forget it, because when people are enslaved, as long as they hold fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. All at once, the church clock struck twelve. He turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk, and bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France! The Boon of Words Once upon a time in the village of Tenali lived a boy called Raman. Raman was a very clever and good-looking boy, but he got on everyone's nerves. They got hold of Raman's mother and warned her that her son would come to a sticky end if she did not take him in hand. She found a holy man who was a teacher and sent Raman off to study with him. Raman was actually quite good at his lessons. His teacher was very pleased with him. His teacher then taught him a mantra and told him to recite it at the nearby temple three million times. If you concentrate and recite it sincerely, the goddess with her thousand heads will reveal herself to you. She will tell you about the occupation you can take up in life. When Raman had chanted the mantra three million times, the goddess revealed herself to him in all her glory. Suddenly, a thought struck Raman and he burst into laughter. She felt quite insulted and thundered. You puny mortal! How dare you laugh at me! I was just wondering, what do you do when you have a cold? How on earth do you manage with a thousand runny noses? Because, because you have dared to laugh at me, you will earn your living as a jester, a wicked kavi. It's a palindrome, weaker ter curvy. It reads the same left to right and right to left. 
the goddess was amazed at raman's wit that made him see a joke even in a curse well since you have such a sense of humor you will be a jester at the court of the king and make a name for yourself raman went on to become a court jester to king krishna deva rai of vijayanagar and became very famous as tenali raman for his jokes and witty answers shoes by rabindranath tagore said good king hobu to minister gobu i wondered all night is it just that whenever my feet should land on the street they come to be sullied by dust your wages you draw but you don't care a straw to serve the demands of the king it's a rank plot to foil me my own soil to soil me i simply won't stand such a thing unless you can find a solution you're all doomed to swift dissolution The terrified minister at these words sinister broke into cold sweat with fright the pundits grew pale and the courtiers once hail lay sleeplessly tossing all night in the minister's home there was weeping and gloom the fires in the kitchen grew cold till crazed with fears his beard drenched in tears he fell at the king's feet and told but how can we live if denied the dust from your feet sanctified that's a question indeed King Hobu agreed, but maybe you should come after us. We need to discuss on this problem of yours. But meanwhile, get rid of the dust. You're getting good money. I don't think it funny. You can't tackle problems like these. There seems little point why I should appoint these scientists with long degrees. So deal with the first things first, or else be prepared. For the worst. Thus royally chided, poor Gobu decided to call the wise men of the land. Each subtle mechanic was summoned in panic. They studied and brooded and scanned. With spectacles perched on the nose, they researched as they took nineteen barrels of snuff. Then warned, if the crust of the earth lost its dust, you couldn't grow food grains enough. Why? What are you wise men worth? Said the king. Can't you tackle the dirt? After some more discussion, they found a solution, which was to buy millions of brooms. The king couldn't breathe, but the dust from the street was driven right into his room. The people that passed were blinded with dust. They coughed and they sneezed in a daze. The dust floated down and wailed all the town. The sun disappeared in the haze. The king remarked, "Now really saw to clear the dust. They've added more. So to douse down the earth and settle the dirt, some two million watermen came. They drained all the lakes to fill water bags, and boats couldn't sail on the stream. The water beasts died as their element dried, while land beasts struggled to swim. All business was stuck." In the slime and the muck, and fever attacked every limb. The king said, "This army of asses has turned all the dust to morasses." So they held more talk, and from every walk, the wise men came to attend. With reeling eyes and dazed surmise, they found of the dust no end. One man had a thought to lay out cloth, or cover the land with mats. All day and night to shut up tight the chamber where the king sat. If they kept him enclosed all the time, his feet couldn't land in the grime. Said the king. That's neat. It would guard my feet, but how could I govern my realm if I'm shut in a room? The land meets its doom. I must have my hand on the helm. So they spoke again. Call the leatherman to sew up the earth in a sack. It will make a great story to His Majesty's glory, and hold all the dust right back. A simple device, if we can, just find out a smart leather man. For such leather wear, they looked everywhere, abandoning all other chores. But no craftsman found, nor hides to go round, even after they knocked on all doors. But just at this while, there rose with a smile 
the Leatherman's grizzled old chief. My lord, please permit that I may submit a measure to bring you relief. The whole earth, you needn't ensheath. Just cover your own two feet. Pooh, were it so easy, we wouldn't be busy, the king said, pursuing our mission. Let him be impaled. The minister railed. Or bind him and throw him in prison. But the old man sat down at the foot of the throne and in leather the royal feet dress. Why? Gobu now said. This was in my head. But how could the blighter have guessed? And that is how shoes were invented. The earth saved and Gobu contented. The Chocolate Cream Soldier A narrow shave. But a miss is as good as a mile. I wish for your sake I had joined the Bulgarian army instead of the other one. I am not a native Serb. No, you are one of the Austrians who set the Serbs on to rob us of our national liberty and who officer their army for them. We hate them. I am a Swiss, fighting merely as a professional soldier. But I am not saved yet. This particular rush will soon pass through, but the pursuit will go on all night by fits and starts. You don't mind my waiting just a minute or two, do you? Oh, not at all. Raina walks with studied elegance to the Ottoman and sits down. Unfortunately, she sits on the pistol and jumps up with a shriek. The man shies like a frightened horse to the other side of the room. Don't frighten me like that. What is it? Pray take it to protect yourself against me. It's not loaded. What use are cartridges in battle? I always carry chocolate instead. Allow me. She sails away scornfully to the chest of drawers and returns with the box of confectionery in her hand. You're an angel. He gobbles the contents. He hands back the box. She snatches it contemptuously from him and throws it away. He shies again as if she had meant to strike him. Don't do things so suddenly, gracious lady. Would you like to see me cry? I'm sorry, I won't scold you. She moves away from the Ottoman. Did you see the great cavalry charge? Oh, tell me about it. Describe it to me. Well, it's a funny sight. It's like slinging a handful of bees against a window pane. First one comes, then two or three close behind him, and then all the rest in a lump. Oh, but I don't believe the first man is a coward. I know he's a hero. Tell me, tell me about him. A regular handsome fellow with flashing eyes and lovely moustache, shouting his war cry and charging like Don Quixote at the windmills. He and his regiment simply committed suicide. Only the pistol missed fire. That's all. She again goes to the chest of drawers. He watches her with a vague hope that she may have something more for him to eat. She takes a portrait from its stand and brings it to him. That is a photograph of the gentleman, the patriot and hero, to whom I am betrothed. Was it fair to lead me on? Yes, that's Don Quixote, not a doubt of it. <laughs> Give me back the portrait, sir. I am really very sorry. Perhaps I'm quite wrong, you know. No doubt I am. You are my enemy and you are at my mercy. What would I do if I were a professional soldier? I know how good you have been to me. To my last hour, I shall remember those three chocolate creams. Thank you. And now I will do a soldierly thing. You cannot stay here after what you have just said about my future husband. I will go out on the balcony and see whether it is safe for you to climb down into the street. The Green Soldier Arun Krishnamurti was just 17 when he founded the NGO Environmentalist Foundation of India, EFI. Beginning with the turtle walk, Arun and his team of volunteers have cleaned 44 lakes and restored 58 water bodies across 12 states in India. Which experience as a child inspired you to take up the cause of the environment? What was your first activity? A beautiful lake next to my house, which once had a lot of birds, 
frogs and snakes was heavily polluted. It led to the spread of mosquitoes and turned a lovely place into an ugly neighborhood. This hurt me and I wanted to do something about it. What kind of support did you get from your parents and teachers? Was there any conflict between studying and activism? I have supportive parents who understood that my interest was the environment. I had teachers who taught me how to go about things. I am not an activist. I am an environmentalist. How did your school and college further your interest? Both my school and college had plenty of green cover and both were home to several other life forms. This made me understand their importance, their beauty and why we need to protect them. Did you feel any hesitation in quitting a well-paying job and venturing into this full-time? What were the options you weighed before you arrived at your decision? I couldn't sit back and enjoy life when environmental damage continued on such a large scale. I wanted to do something and that something needed my full attention. What kind of garbage do people throw into water bodies? How do you deal with the removal of this garbage once you clean the water body? We find everything in our lakes. This is so disturbing because it is water and water is the basis of life. How many days does it take to clear a large lake? Do you use any special equipment for cleaning and safety? It can take anywhere between 5 days to 3 months to completely clean a lake. We use tools like rakes and spades. What kind of protective gear do you use? Can you describe the cleaning process briefly? We wear nose masks, sanitary gloves and carry rakes and spades with which we collect the garbage and dump it into collection buckets which are taken to the garbage truck. We also use heavy machinery like earth movers and poklane to desilt the lake and clear the weeds and shrubs that are harmful. What, in your opinion, can children and young adults do for the environment? What could be a small beginning by all of us in terms of protecting the environment? Firstly, we should all stop throwing trash outside our homes. Next. We should reduce the amount of trash we generate from our homes. How much time do school-going children need to devote for an environmental cause? Four hours a weekend. How can students and schools join your fraternity? Do you have any programs to introduce your work to them? Yes, we offer fellowships to interested students. We give them training in these areas and get them actively involved in all our work. What is the Rolex Award and what does it mean to you? Rolex is a Swiss watch brand and they awarded us the Rolex Award for Enterprise. This award is an encouragement and a reminder that we need to work more to ensure that everyone participates in the effort to protect the environment. All in the city of Hyderabad by Sarojini Naidu. See how the speckled sky burns like a pigeon's throat, jeweled with embers of opal and peridot. See the white river that flashes and scintillates, curved like a tusk from the mouth of the city gates. Hark from the minaret, how the muezzins call floats like a battle flag over the city wall. From trellised balconies, languid and luminous, faces gleam, veiled in a splendor voluminous. Leisurely elephants wind through the winding lanes, swinging their silver bells, hung from their silver chains. Round the high charminar, sounds of gay cavalcades blend with the music of cymbals and serenades. Over the city bridge, night comes majestical, born like a queen to a sumptuous festival. Malgudi Cricket Club What would you say to a cricket team? Rajam asked. 
what shall we call it? It is the MCC. If we get into any trouble, I shall declare before the judge that MCC stands for Malgudi Cricket Club. After a while, Swaminathan asked, Look here, do you think we shall have to pay tax or something to the government? Racham realized at this point that the starting of a cricket team was the most complicated problem on earth. They sat round Rajam's table in his room. Money held before him a catalogue of Messrs. Bins, the shop for sports goods. In about an hour, they selected from the catalogue their team's requirements. And then came the most difficult part of the whole affair. A letter to Messrs. Bins, ordering goods. Rajam took up the task himself. Half an hour later, he placed on the table a letter. The MCC and its organizers had solid proof that they were persons of count when a letter from Bins came addressed to the captain, MCC, Malgudi. Three heads buzzed over the meaning of this letter. The trouble was that they could not understand whether Bins were going to send the goods or not. In the end, they came to the conclusion that the letter was sent to them by mistake. This letter was put in a cover with a covering letter and dispatched. The covering letter said, We are very sorry that you sent me somebody's letter. We are returning this somebody's letter. Please send our things immediately. Krishnan, Nature's Spokesman by Ramachandra Guha Krishnan was a pioneering environmentalist and conservationist. He knew and practiced environmental education before the term had been coined. Consider his essay, Nature Study, printed in the Hindu on the 18th of May, 1947. The school approach to nature study, wrote this former school teacher, is fundamentally unsound. It is based on the theory that one must proceed from elementary, understandable things. There is simplification and selection and logical, reasoned steps guide the approach. But the fact is that nature is not simple, logical and reasoned. <laughs> Thank God that it is not. There is no need to fully understand anything in all its structure and complexity to be alive to its charm. What makes living things fascinating is their behavior, not their anatomy. Children in primary schools should get to know the common wild plants and birds of the locality. Birds because they are so easily watched. They should learn, a little later perhaps, the stories of the domestic animals. They should be taken out to see nature for themselves and be given pleasant books with gay, colorful illustrations. Children love them and will readily interest themselves in any text if it is free from morals and illustrated in color. Krishnan was India's best all-round naturalist. Salim Ali knew more, much more than him about Indian birds. Jim Corbett better understood the behavior of large mammals in the wild. Some botanists were more closely acquainted with Indian plants. Some herpetologists with Indian reptiles. But no one knew as much as Krishnan about so many different aspects of the natural world in India. Krishnan lived and died in Chennai, known in his time as Madras, but spent much of the year in the field accompanied only by his camera, a notebook, a sketch pad, and a change of clothes. He was familiar with the snows of the Himalayas, the deserts of Rajasthan, the mangroves of the Sundarbans, and the grasslands of the Deccan. He wrote quite beautifully about these varied terrains, and about the insects, plants, birds, and animals that inhabited them. The best introduction to Krishnan is through his writings. So let me now quote from some of the thousands of nature essays that he published in his long and very full life. I shall begin with an essay published in 1961, when the government of India was deciding upon the choice of the national bird. Here, Krishnan said the leading candidate was the peacock, for everyone knows it and has seen it. It is to be found all over India, and it is intimately and anciently associated with our religious and countryside legends and culture. Further, it is so distinctive in its arresting beauty that it lends itself to unmistakable formalized description. 
In fact, it has been so depicted in our folk and classical art. He went on to say, I shall be greatly surprised. Why, I shall be astonished if any other bird is ultimately preferred for the honor. Still, to make the debate more interesting, he decided to press the claims of the common miner. These were his reasons. Those sacred to no god. It is well known to our legends and folk songs and is one of the most familiar birds in the country. Being especially common in and around human settlements, both in the plains and the lower hills. And in spite of being so common, few birds have a richer plumage as the naturalist Eha pointed out long ago. The contrast of the cadmium yellow of its legs and beak and facial patches with the Van Dyke brown of its plumage and the black of its head and the blaze of white on each wing that lends its flight such vividness are contrasts that could be most effectively formalized in an emblem. It has an additional claim. It is frequently caged and trained to talk. And in our folk songs, it is often entrusted with the delivery of messages to loved ones far away. A kind of ambassadorial responsibility that is surely an asset in any nation. This passage carried the hallmarks of Krishnan's writing and attention to the everyday aspects of nature, not merely to its most spectacular forms or manifestations. An understanding of shape and size and color and form natural in a trained artist, a knowledge of our folk and literary traditions and a sense of Jabberwocky Twas brillig and the slithy tubes did gyre and gimble in the wave all mimsy were the borrow grooves and the mom rats outgrave Beware the jabberwock my son the jaws that bite the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vocal sword in hand, long time the mansoom for he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in a fish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through. The vocal blade went snick-a-snack. He left it dead, and with its head, he went galumping back. And as thou slain the jabberwock, come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, kaloo kalay. He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy tubes did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borrow groups and the mom rats outgrave. At breakfast, the morning of the party, Millie found it difficult to keep a pretense of interest in anything so prosaic as toast and chops. She plied Bob with questions. She worried him with her misgivings. She quit her seat to embrace her mother violently. Then she was off to the kitchen and dragging Kitty, the maid, up two flights to view the creation in pink and white beneath the chandelier. A while later, the restless Millie stood out upon the front steps, gazing up into the misty October sky in search of weather indications upon which she might base some prognostications of her own. It was then that the postman came along and with a polite greeting handed her the morning mail, quite a batch of it. She slowly turned into the house, glancing over the circulars and letters and in a manner assorting them. There was a letter to her mother from her Aunt Jane. She knew the stiff formal handwriting mailed from the distant town in which her Aunt Mildred lay sick. A dread that for the moment made her feel faint took possession of Millie. She crept into the quiet parlor and sat there undisturbed, staring at the outside of her Aunt Jane's letter. 
Her fingers seemed to feel for the annoyance which that sealed envelope might cover. Her eyes seemed to penetrate and unveil the threat against her longed for and looked for pleasure. What difference would a day make? She turned and turned the letter about. What difference could a day make? None whatever, as Millie counted days. Yet, she could feel her heart thump with guilty excitement as she slipped the letter into her pocket. She then went on upstairs and laid the mail in the usual place upon the sitting room table, glad that her mother was not there at the moment to unmask her shame-faced consciousness. It was a hateful occurrence that threw a damper upon her joy. During the school hours, the letter concealed in her pocket seemed like a live thing, a reptile, a slimy thing. When her hand accidentally encountered it, she almost made up her mind to deliver it to her mother when she returned at three o'clock. Oh, but the merry time ahead! What chatter! Like the twittering sparrows among the russet leaves as the girls walked home beneath the trees. What breathless chatter of gowns, of hair ornaments, of slippers and fluttering ribbons. But Millie knew there was nothing that would compare with the pink and white cloud floating beneath the chandelier in her room. All her eagerness returned and nothing marred it. Not even the sight of her mother's face, perplexed with an uneasy sadness. Bob was distinctly proud of his pretty sister when she stood outside for household inspection that night, but he would have considered it an unpardonable weakness to say so. You'll do, Millie. Rub some of the paint off your cheeks. Oh, what a joke! Kitty, the maid, howled at the humor of it. You'll be after her to take the sparkle out of her shining eyes next, Mr. Bob. Go away with ye. Millie, in a joyous state, turned into a show window robot, while the gentle mother enveloped her in a fleecy white cape, brought to light for the occasion from the relic trunk. There have been thousands of parties exactly like that one, but no one could have made Millie believe so. What applause at her recitation! What side-splitting laughter over the charades! What a hush of appreciation over the beautiful tableaus! And then, the attentions of the college boys, the compliments, the mountains of ice creams, the islands of sponge cakes, the running river of lemonade! Millie's excitement held her all the way home, clinging to Bob's arm, her little nervous steps kept a dancing pace to his unthinking stride. It followed her to her very pillow. But there, before she closed her eyes, a lull came upon her senses. The joy all melted out of her soul, and the vision of a letter held sway in her dreams all through the night. There was nothing haphazard in the fact that Millie stationed herself upon the front steps the following morning. She was pale. Something had, as Bob would have said, rubbed the paint off her cheeks, and that same something had taken the sparkle out of her eyes and left in its stead a dull anxiety. She was waiting for the postman. When he handed her the scanty mail, she added to the pile the letter in her pocket and carried it directly to her mother, who sat at the sitting room table, bending over some sewing. Millie did not withdraw, but stood there, watching at a little distance. Somehow, she was not startled when the letter trembled in her mother's hand, when the tears gathered and fell upon the fluttering sheets. What is it, mother? asked Millie. In a dry voice that did not sound to her like her own, she darted forward and with an encircling arm drew her mother's head against her throbbing heart. What is it, mother dear? What makes you cry? Your Aunt Mildred cannot recover. The doctors have given her up. I am going. I must go to her. Rising with agitation and clasping Millie closely. News in Agra by Ruskin Bond. It is difficult to view the Taj at noon. 
the sun strikes the white marble and there is a great dazzle of reflected light. I stand there with averted eyes looking at everything, the formal gardens, the surrounding walls of red sandstone, the winding river, everything except the monument I have come to see. It is there, of course, very solid and real, perfectly preserved with every jade, jasper or lapis lazuli playing its part in the overall design. And after a while, I can shade my eyes and take in a vision of shimmering white marble. The light rises in waves from the shimmering paving stones and the squares of black and white marble create an effect of running water. Inside the chamber, it is cool and dark, but rather musty. And I waste no time in hurrying out into the sunlight. I walk the length of a gallery and turn with some relief to the river scene. The sluggish Yamuna winds past Agra on its way to union with the Ganga. I know the Yamuna well. I know where it merges from the foothills near Kalsi, cold and blue from the melting snows. I know it as it winds its ways through fields of wheat and sugarcane and mustard across the flat plains of Uttar Pradesh. Sometimes placid, sometimes in flood. I know the river at Delhi, where its muddy banks are a patchwork of clothes spread out by the hundreds of washermen who serve the city, and I know it in Mathura, where it is alive with huge turtles. Mathura, sacred city, whose beginnings are lost in antiquity. And then the river winds its way to Agra, to this spot by the Taj, where parrots flash in the sunshine, kingfishers swoop low over the water, and a peacock struts across the lawns surrounding the monument. I follow the peacock into a shady grove. It is quite tame and does not fly away. It leads me to a small boy who is sitting in the shade of a tree, feasting on a handful of small green fruit. I have not seen the fruit before, and I ask the boy to tell me what it is. He offers me what looks like a hard green plum. It is the fruit from the Ashoka tree, says the boy. There are many such trees in the garden. Mm, are you allowed to take the fruit? I am allowed, he says, grinning. My father is the head gardener. I bite into the fruit. It is hard and sour, but not unpleasant. Do you live here? I ask. Over the wall, he says. But I come here every day to help my father and to eat the fruit. So you see the Taj Mahal every day? I have seen it every day for as long as I can remember. And I am seeing it for the first time. Hmm, you are very lucky, he shrugs. If you see it once or a hundred times, it is the same. It doesn't change. Don't you like looking at it then? I like looking at the people who come here. They are always different. In the evening, there will be many people. You must have seen people from almost every country in the world. That is so. They all come here to look at the Taj. The kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers and film stars and poor people too. And I look at them. In that way, it isn't boring. <laughs> well, you have the Taj to thank for that. He gazes thoughtfully at the shimmering monument. His eyes are accustomed to the sharp sunlight. He sees the Taj every day. But at this moment, he is really looking at it, thinking about it, wondering what magic it must possess to attract people from all corners of the earth, to bring them here walking through his father's well-kept garden so that he can have something new and fresh to look at each day. A cloud, a very small cloud, passes across the face of the sun. And in the softened light, I too am able to look at the Taj without screwing up my eyes. As the boy said, it does not change. Therein lies its beauty. 
for the effect on the traveller is the same today as it was 300 years ago when Bernier wrote. Nothing offends the eye. No part can be found that is not skillfully wrought or that it has no peculiar beauty. And so, for a few moments, this poem and marble is on view to two unimportant people. The itinerant writer and the gardener's boy. We see nothing. There is really nothing to be said. But now, a few months later, when I try to recapture the essence of that day, it is not the monument that I remember most vividly. The Taj is there, of course. I still see it as a mirror for the sun. But what remains with me more than anything else is the passage of the river and the sharp flavor of the Ashoka fruit. How's my coal? How's my coal getting on? I set as much aside for you as I could. Don't use it all up at once. It might come in handy one day. How's my oil fairing? It keeps best underground in the dark. Doesn't do so well in the light. Don't let it spoil. How's the wind blowing? I try to keep it moving. Keep it on the muscle. Keep the pressure on. Make it hustle. Any breaking news on wave power? I've hired an intern to handle the oceans. If we could make some ripples, get more converts, that would be swell. I assume you are using solar, right? This other stuff's for backup, in case there's a rainy day for me in space. A Handful of Clay by Henry Van Dyke One day, the clay felt itself taken from the place where it had waited so long. A flat blade of iron passed beneath it and lifted it and tossed it into a cart with other lumps of clay. And it was carried far away, as it seemed, over a rough and stony road. But it was not afraid nor discouraged, for it said to itself, This is necessary. The path to glory is always rugged. Now I am on my way to play a great part in the world. But the hard journey was nothing compared with the tribulation and distress that came after it. The clay was put into a trough and mixed and beaten and stirred and trampled. It seemed almost unbearable. But there was consolation in the thought that something very fine and noble was certainly coming out of all this trouble. The clay felt sure that, if it could only wait long enough, a wonderful reward was in store for it. Then it was put upon a swiftly turning wheel and whirled around until it seemed as if it must fly into a thousand pieces. A strange power pressed it and moulded it as it revolved, and through all the dizziness and pain it felt that it was taking a new form. Then an unknown hand put it into an oven, and fires were kindled about it, fierce and penetrating, hotter than all the heats of summer that had ever brooded upon the bank of the river. But through all, the clay held itself together and endured its trials in the confidence of a great future. Surely, it thought, I am intended for something very splendid, since such pains are taken with me. Perhaps I am fashioned for the ornament of a temple or a precious vase for the table of a king. At last, the baking was finished. The clay was taken from the furnace and set down upon the board, in the cool air, under the blue sky. The tribulation was past. The reward was at hand. Close beside the board, there was a pool of water, not very deep, nor very clear, 
but calm enough to reflect with impartial truth every image that fell upon it. There, for the first time, as it was lifted from the board, the clay saw its new shape, the reward of all its patience and pain, the consummation of its hopes, a common flower pot, straight and stiff, red and ugly. And then it felt that it was not destined for a king's house, nor for a palace of art, because it was made without glory or beauty or honour, and it murmured against the unknown maker, saying, Why hast thou made me thus? Many days it passed in sullen discontent. Then it was filled with earth, and something, it knew not what, but something rough and brown and dead-looking, was thrust into the middle of the earth and covered over. The clay rebelled at this new disgrace. This is the worst of all that has happened to me, to be filled with dirt and rubbish. Surely I am a failure. But presently it was set in a greenhouse, where the sunlight fell warm upon it, and water was sprinkled over it. And day by day as it waited, a change began to come to it. Something was stirring within it, a new hope. Still it was ignorant and knew not what the new hope meant. One day the clay was lifted again from its place and carried into a great church. Its dream was coming true after all. It had a fine part to play in the world. Glorious music flowed over it. It was surrounded with flowers. Still it could not understand. So it whispered to another vessel of clay, like itself, close beside it. Why have they set me here? Why do all the people look toward us? And the other vessel answered, Do you not know? You are carrying a royal scepter of lilies. Their petals are white as snow, and the heart of them is like pure gold. The people look this way because the flower is the most wonderful in the world, and the root of it is in your heart. Then the clay was content, and silently thanked its maker, because, though an earthen vessel, it held so great a treasure. For a greener tomorrow, Grandmother was talking about her father and his great love for trees and flowers. Grandmother said, I was never able to get over the feeling that plants and trees loved my father with as much tenderness as he loved them. I was sitting beside him on the veranda steps one morning when I noticed the tendril of a creeping vine that was trailing near my feet. As we sat there in the soft winter sunshine, I saw the tendril moving very slowly away from me and towards my father. Your great-grandfather had served many years in the Indian Forest Service, and so it was natural that he should know, understand, and like trees. On his retirement, he built this bungalow on the outskirts of the town, planting the trees that you see around it now. Of course, there were other trees here before the house was built, including an old people which had forced its way through the walls of an old, abandoned temple, knocking the bricks down with its vigorous growth. What happened to the temple? asked Koki. Well, my mother wanted the peepal tree cut down. But my father said he would save both the tree and the temple. So he rebuilt the temple around the tree. And there it is, on the other side of the wall. The tree protects the temple and the temple protects the tree. Your great-grandfather wasn't content with planting trees in the garden or near the house. During the monsoons, he would walk into the scrubland and beyond the riverbed 
armed with cuttings and saplings and he would plant them out there, hoping to create a forest. No one ever goes there, I said. Who will see your forest? We are not planting it for people to see, said my father. We are planting it for the earth and for the birds and animals who live on it and need more food and shelter. Father told me why mankind and not only wild creatures need trees for keeping the desert away, for attracting rain, for preventing the banks of rivers from being washed away. But everywhere, people are cutting down trees without planting new ones. If this continues, then one day there will be no forests at all and the world will become one great desert. The thought of a world without trees became a sort of nightmare for me. On one of our walks along the river bank, about a mile upstream from here, we found an island, a small rocky island in the middle of the river bed. As soon as the monsoon arrived, and while the river could still be crossed, we set out with a number of mango, laburnum, hibiscus, and coral tree saplings and cuttings, and spent the better part of a day planting them on the little island. The trees you planted with your father, are they still there? You can see them for yourself if you feel like taking a walk. I came to live here again after 20 years or more. I walked out of the old house and took the same path that my father and I used to take during our walks. The trees seemed to know me. I am sure they whispered among themselves and beckoned me nearer. The trees had multiplied. The forest was on the move. In one small corner of the world, my father's dream was coming true and trees were walking again. Advia. My brother and I had come to spend our holidays with my parents in the small town of Kunduz, not far from the Russian border, where our father worked as an engineer at the Khanabad Irrigation Project. We had visited the historical place of Bark over the weekend and were on our way back when everything began to oppress me. I looked at my brother sitting next to me in the car. Suddenly, he put into words what I had been thinking. Look at this site. Isn't it a perfect hiding place for decoits? My mother started and shot a questioning glance at my father, who laughed softly. He said, The people of Afghanistan are rather friendly and hospitable. After the next bend, before the road began to rise, my father slowed down and brought the car to a halt on the right. Nothing to worry about, he assured us. I am checking the rear wheels. Looking up the road, I saw two men rushing towards our car. The taller of the two charged at us. The other one limped behind awkwardly. Their eyes glittered from under their soiled turbans. Their ankle-length black coats, with long sleeves hanging at both sides, flapped around them. I shrieked and pointed at them. Decoits! Decoits! My brother was out of the door and calling to my father. Papa! Decoits! They're coming straight at us! Come back! We have to leave! Start the car, Papa! Hurry! Please! Sudhir banged the door shut and shouted at us. Shut the doors! Wind up the window glass! Fast! I pressed myself back into the seat of the car, paralyzed with fear. I kept staring at the two men advancing towards the car at my side. The taller of the two had already reached the bonnet. His left hand slid over the metal and touched my mother's window. I was aware of my father squeezing himself behind the steering wheel. Winding up, he shouted, Lock the doors! Lock the doors! But his voice seemed to reach me from a distance. My eyes were fixed on the face of the man and I did not notice the glass moving down as I turned the handle in the wrong direction. Then from behind the agitated man, the other one emerged. Grabbing my arm, he roared, Atviya! 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 
Then I was thrown forward against the back of the front seat and bounced back again. The decoit was jerked forward. He released my arm but hung onto the window. As the car gathered speed, he fell into a run beside it, still holding onto the window frame with his left hand. Our car sped along the unmetalled road, leaving behind a cloud of dust. Sudhir cried excitedly. We licked them. We shook them off, Pa. Wow! But I wasn't pleased at all. I was on the verge of crying as I fought the voice still running through my head. Atmiya! Atmiya! Pa, I said finally after we had had our dinner. I would like to look up the word Advia. I wonder what it means. My father returned from the bedroom with a thick dictionary. It did not take him long to find the word. His face was pale and his eyes looked troubled as he said in a flat voice. Advia means medicine. I stared at my mother and at my brother and began to cry. All About a Dog by A.J. Gardiner It was a bitterly cold night, and even at the far end of the bus, the east wind that raved along the street cut like a knife. The bus stopped, and two women and a man got in together and filled the vacant places. One young woman was dressed in seal skin and carried one of those little Pekingese dogs that women in seal skin like to carry in their laps. The conductor came in and took the fares. Then his eyes rested with cold malice on the beady-eyed dog. I saw trouble brewing. This was the opportunity for which he had been waiting, and he intended to make the most of it. I had marked him as the type of what Mr. Wells had called the resentful employee. The man with a general vague grievance against everything and a particular grievance against passengers who came and sat in his bus while he shivered at the door. You must take that dog out, he said with sour venom. I shall certainly do nothing of the kind. You can take my name and address, said the woman, who had evidently expected the challenge and knew the reply. You must take that dog out. That's my order. I won't go on the top in such weather. It would kill me, said the woman. Certainly not, said her lady companion. You've got a cough as it is. It's nonsense, said her male companion. The conductor pulled the bell and the bus stopped. This bus doesn't go until that dog is brought out. And he stepped on to the pavement and waited. It was his moment of triumph. He had the law on his side and a whole bus full of angry people under the harrow. His embittered soul was having a real holiday. The storm inside rose high. Shameful. He's no better than a dictator. Why isn't he in the army? Call the police. Let's all report him. Let's make him give us our fares back. For everybody was on the side of the lady and the dog. That little animal sat blinking at the dim lights in happy unconsciousness of the rumpus, of which he was the cause. The conductor came to the door. What's your number? said one passenger, taking out a pocketbook with a gesture of terrible things. There's my number, said the conductor imperturbably. Give us our fares back. You've engaged to carry us. You can't leave us here all night. No fares back, said the conductor. Two or three passengers got out and disappeared into the night. The conductor took another turn on the pavement, and then went and had a talk with the driver. Another bus, the last on the road, sailed by, indifferent to the shouts of the passengers to stop. They stick by each other, the villains, was the comment. Someone pulled the bell violently. That brought the driver round to the door. Who's conductor of this bus? He sneered and paused for a reply. None coming from the passengers. He returned to his seat and resumed drumming a rhythm on the steering wheel. There was no hope in that quarter. A policeman strolled up and looked in at the door. 
an avalanche of indignant protests and appeals burst on him. Well, he's got his rules, you know, he said genially. Give your name and address. That's what he's been offered, and he won't take it, said the lady. Oh, said the policeman, and he went away and took his stand a few yards down the street, where he was joined by two more constables, and still the little dog blinked at the lights, and the conductor walked to and fro on the pavement, like a captain on the quarter deck in the hour of victory. A young woman, whose voice had risen high above the gale inside, descended on him with an air of threatening and slaughter. He was immovable, as cold as the night and as hard as the pavement. She passed on in a fury of impotence to the three policemen, who stood like a group of statuary up the street watching the drama. Then she came back, imperiously beckoned to her young man, who had sat a silent witness of her rage, and vanished. Others followed. The bus was emptying. Even the dashing young fellow who had demanded the number, and who had declared he would see this thing through if he sat there all night, had taken an opportunity to slip away.